thank you, Nikki, and thank you, Mark, for uh, this, this, <coughs> yeah, for the very kind introduction. And uh, uh, before I get started, I'm just wearing this uh, pink shirt because uh, today is a pink shirt day, uh, uh, day to for the anti-bullying. And uh, you know, of course, we should fight against bullying. But I, I, I now understand. Uh, why bullying bad is bad because my three-year-old started bullying me. So, <laughs> okay, so it's really a great honor uh, to be back here in honor of Richard Erickson. Uh, he personally he has been like a father, father figure uh, for me academically, and my father only went to uh, junior high school, so. You know, I just came from different sort of working uh, family, and so having him uh, here really uh, was uh, important for me. And uh, I'm also happy to be back here talking about the real uh, science that I do, because I was a uh, one of the uh, troublemakers so <laughs> when I was living here. So, so uh, <laughs> you know, all the trouble that I called, caused him. Uh, now I want to literally pay back uh, uh, by uh, try, trying to tell you what I do for a living now. Uh, <laughs> one of the troubles uh, I caused uh, Richard and Diana was uh, I recruited Matt uh, Erickson, uh, who was at a high school at that time, as a DJ for a, a monthly uh, pub night. Uh, so this is a, a, a you know students uh, get together in the next building with a drink. Well, initially, you have to. Uh, negotiate with Richard the legal terms of, of having a, starting a pub night, uh, how much food uh, you, you can have. But you know, as you keep pushing, he got kind of sort of bent back a little bit. And, and it, it became one of the biggest parties, uh, <laughs> mostly party on campus. And I, I got shut down once by the, the dining society manager that just, who are the, is, he sweared at me, who, 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 who are, the, are these people coming from? So that was one of the uh, pro problems that, that I caused. And, uh, uh, there, there are many other things that I can't really, I don't want to say. I liked living here so much. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, that, that, in, in, back in those days, it was like only two years. You're two, allowed two years of residency. I think you now can live longer. But that two years really special uh, day, years for me. And I, I liked it so much that when I came back as a faculty, I actually applied to live here again. <laughs> but, but Patricia was acting a uh, principal, and I think she, she supported it, but the membership committee. <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, well, I don't know. I guess, actually, it's, uh, I, I hope she supported it, but anyway, men <laughs> membership committee rejected it, so, so I, I couldn't live here. And it's, it's, it's not the same if you can't live here. So for, for whoever who's living here, it's, uh, it's, it's good for you. <clears throat> Uh, so this talk today is going to be a non-technical. I, I don't see any physicists that I know here. So that's, that's the best so that's, that, that I, I, I'm aiming at this uh, <coughs> audience. Uh, there may be physicists that I don't know. Excuse me if that's the case. Uh, but, uh, uh, but also, in the spirit of uh, interdisciplinarity, I thought I'd just throw in some random thoughts in this uh, curly brackets for maybe as a, as a topic for dinner conversation. In fact, initially, I suggested to mark the title of uh, Deconstructing Antimatter. A reference to uh, uh, post-modernism uh, uh, was popular in 1990s uh, at this particular college. So we're talking about uh, uh, post-modernism every day at at at, <laughs> at, at, uh, at, uh, uh, at uh, breakfast. Marx first told me that I, okay, it's passé. It's like 20 years old. <laughs> and secondly, but, but but then 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 do you understand the de deconstruction? And he started giving me a 15 minutes lecture. So I said, <laughs> 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 okay, thank you, Mark. Ma I got the point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So that's why uh, I, I, I did give uh, diff, this, this different uh, uh, title. And I'll, I'll get back to this title a little bit later. <clears throat> so now, let's go into the main part of the, uh, the talk. <clears throat> so <clears throat> when you think about antimatter, maybe you think of this. The antimatter pods are ready to blow up the moment we go into warp drive. I can't give you warp nine much longer, Mr. Spock. These engines are beginning to show signs of stress. So in Star Trek, uh, spaceship travel on antimatter fuel. Or maybe, as Nikki uh, said, That canister contains an extremely combustible substance called antimatter. We need to locate it immediately or evacuate Vatican City. 
The antimatter is suspended there in an airtight nanocomposite shell with electromagnets on each end. But if it were to fall out of suspension and come in contact with matter, say the bottom of the canister, then the two opposing forces would annihilate one another violently. Okay, so it's a serious stuff in the movie. <laughs> uh, that you, canister. You may sound like you may think that it's it's uh, science fiction stuff, uh, but uh, today I'll tell you and explain some of the, the scientific facts that it really exists. And. Uh, uh, but there's a mystery associated with uh, antimatter, and it may be a key to the understanding of the universe. <clears throat> so <clears throat> before we talk about antimatter, what's the matter with antimatter? Maybe we should talk about what's the matter, what is the matter? Because <clears throat> the physicists just use this, but, but the matter uh, uh, is uh, the stuff that we're made of, just, just to be clear. And for example, hydrogen is made of a proton and electron, uh, the, the subatomic uh, particles. And uh, uh, matter is made of, uh, and, and <clears throat> so this is a, in a sort of animation of uh, hydrogen and antihydrogen. And, 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 uh, and uh, we like this uh, uh, atom because it's very simple, only one particle uh, of, uh, of uh, proton and electron. And if he's uh, a simple people, uh, so we like simple stuff. <clears throat> so this is a reductionist approach uh, of trying to uh, study the, 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 the smallest uh, 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 substance. Uh, this strategy has worked quite, quite well in the last uh, several centuries actually. It's not the only approach to study nature. Uh, for example, complexity uh, theory uh, is another area. But, uh, but, but we uh, particle physicists try to study things uh, uh, in a small uh, and simple system. So compare this one, uh, elect one proton, one uh, electron system of hydrogen was, uh, was this one, uranium. There's about like, 90 electrons and 240 uh, neutrons and protons. This is just too complicated for me. Uh, so so I, I like to stick to the, the simple stuff. <clears throat> so the universe, uh, let's talk about universe. What is the universe made of? Well, this 75% of the known substance in the universe is made of hydrogen. So to a good approximation, we're all made of hydrogen. So you probably get 75% mark with that answer in, in your physics. <laughs> <coughs> the, the, the rest is almost a helium uh, uh, of known substance. But there's stuff that we don't know. We know uh, they exist, we, we think it exists, but we don't know what they are. Dark matter and dark energy. And so this, we won't talk about it, but this is just completely separate talks. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, but uh, <clears throat> at least uh, hydrogen, uh, we think we know it very well. <clears throat> because it's simple. So there's this cartoon. <laughs> <coughs> can you, can you, do you want to move uh, somewhere? <coughs> uh, <coughs> so actually, I just re preparing my, I mean, I used this uh, cartoon many times uh, before, but I just preparing for today's lecture at Green College, just realized that this guy may be uh, more profound than he, he may sound, actually. Because there are actually physical theories nowadays which uh, have no practical implications in any of observa observations. And, uh, and it's a kind of a topic of a debate whether, whether it's actually it's a science or not. And, and so, so, th so this, this comes in the curry bracket. It's, it's a sort of a, not, not ha doesn't have to do exactly uh, directly to my uh, topic of antimatter, but this is perhaps uh, for dinner. Uh, conversation. <clears throat> so before going to what's the matter with antimatter, what's the matter with matter? What's, ma what's matter with matter is it shouldn't exist. As I explained it, this has something to do with antimatter. <clears throat> so now I'll give a brief history uh, of, of uh, antimatter. <clears throat> Now, again, a curry bracket. What do we talk about history when we talk about science or anything else? I mean, there's no guarantee that learning about past is going to tell you anything when it comes to science. Right? We'll try to always uh, create new theories. So what, I mean, why bother with, with, the, with the history? Curry bracket. Now, according to, <coughs> uh, this is a recent tweet, uh, or a recent uh, uh, tweet that I, I mean, t tweet, is it great? Like you learn a lot of stuff in tweet, actually. So, so, <laughs> so it's not a complete waste of time. 
So, so, so this is Steve Weinberg, and, uh, one of the greatest uh, thinkers uh, that, that is alive, uh, Nobel Laureate from many years ago, said this. So why should you learn history? Oh, by knowing the history behind, uh, we feel part of great historical progression since motion keeps us out of a desk and in uh, laboratories. I mean, it's not wrong, but it sounds kind of shallow. I mean, I, I, I mean, one can do probably better than this. So, people at Green Cards, please, please tell me why we should uh, study history of science and, and, and talk about history of science when we talk about the physics of science. <clears throat> anyway, I'll talk about the history. <clears throat> and to talk about the history <clears throat> of uh, antimatter, I have to talk about history of physics, starting from Newton. So Newton, in the 17th century, uh, uh, discovered, invented this, uh, cra what, what we call classical mechanics. And almost all, everything that uh, has to do with the daily uh, experience can be described by Newton, <coughs> Newton's laws of uh, physics. But if you go very fast, if you're studying a system that moves really, really fast, then uh, you have to uh, introduce a new theory, uh, <coughs> Einstein's uh, uh, special relativity. If you're, going, if you're studying very, very small scale, <coughs> uh, then you have to have, have another law <coughs> of physics called quantum mechanics, which was developed by, in the 1920s by Schrodinger and et al. <coughs> <coughs> now, it turned out that uh, uh, these days, uh, in, in the early uh, part of the last century, these two theories were not compatible. The prediction of one theory just didn't make sense from other, another point of view. Uh, whenever there's uh, conflicting uh, uh, theories, uh, 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 that's a sort of a sign that there's something wrong with the whole, whole system, whole, whole, whole concept. So you require tip, often a paradigm shift uh, to, to uh, solve this kind of dilemma. And that's what uh, was done. And antimatter was predicted by uh, Paul Dirac, Dirac, a British physicist, uh, in order to uh, solve this uh, dilemma by formulating a relativistic uh, uh, version of quantum mechanics. <clears throat> and it's predicted existence of uh, anti-electrons, which we now call uh, positrons. So this is a Paul Dirac on the left, and, and this uh, anti anti Dirac on the right. <laughs> you heard this, I guess. <laughs> uh, good. <clears throat> anti what? Anti-electric, perhaps. A <laughs> uh, few years later, only uh, uh, four years later, Anderson found uh, uh, the evidence of uh, existence of antimatter in a cosmic ray study. So this is a, a picture then. Uh, basically, the, uh, this position, antimatter particle, going through for, in this photograph uh, of track uh, going through from the bottom to the top. And the way, because of the how magnetic fields applied in, the, in this uh, uh, photograph, <coughs> if it was a regular electrons, it would have bent it to the right. But since it bent it to the left, you can tell that this was actually really uh, had an opposite charge from electrons. <coughs> and uh, so that was a discovery of uh, uh, anti-electrons. Uh, antiproton was discovered many years uh, later. And uh, so this is a, a kind of snapshot of the uh, a chalkboard in a Berkeley lab, where they were kind of making progress report of their antiproton experiment. Uh, back in those days, there was uh, no internet, so I guess they uh, presumably communicated like this. <coughs> so uh, so they, they detected 38 uh, uh, negative particles co consistent with the mass of uh, uh, antiprotons. Uh, and I'll get to this number 38 later. Uh, but I guess there was some, some baseball game going on at the same time. <laughs> so, so, so there was... <coughs> <laughs> now, <coughs> so the specifically, uh, I, I be, I'm studying the, uh, what's called anti-hydrogen, which is antimatter counterpart of a uh, uh, hydrogen, uh, which is uh, which ma is made of uh, antiproton, antimatter of a proton, and the positron, antimatter of electrons. And sometimes I refer to this as an anti-H uh, in my uh, <coughs> talk. So what is this antimatter stuff that is predicted by Dirac? <coughs> now, technically speaking, the antimatter is a substance that, that uh, satisfies Dirac's equation, which is this, which is shown in uh, uh, his memorial in West 
Westminster Abbey uh, at church near London. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, so, so I'm told. <laughs> I've never been there. I should. <clears throat> now, uh, you can also get a, a tattoo these days of this uh, 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 equation. So this is a profound equation, so maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's okay. I, I, I would recommend my daughter to have this tattoo. Uh, uh, maybe you're different if you're a mathematician, uh, but uh, anyway. So I'm going to, instead of uh, talking about equation, I'm going to give you an analogy. So if you're a physicist, you please don't get offended because it's just only approximate uh, thing that I'm talking about here. <coughs> so uh, for every particle, uh, there's an antiparticle. And, and this is my analogy. Uh, matter and antimatter is like a twin brother and sister. So here's uh, Alice and Bob, with the typical Japanese name, uh, twin uh, brother and sister, <coughs> which is an analogous to matter and mat antimatter, hydrogen and antihydrogen. <coughs> so Alice and Bob have opposite sex. <coughs> uh, matter and antimatter has uh, opposite uh, electric charge. Alice and Bob are both humans, and they come from the same family, and the same ethnicity. Matter and antimatter are the same kinds of particle. It belongs to a, a classification called family. So family in particle physics is a, is a te technical term that classify a, a, a particle. And they also uh, have the same flavor. That's another classification of, of particle physics. <clears throat> Uh, as and Bob have similar weight, uh, the physical strength is similar. Uh, matter and antimatter are supposed to have exactly the same mass, and they experience the same force. So here's the experimental proof uh, that uh, matter antimatter exists. So they, this twin uh, have uh, approximately the same mass and the same physical strength. <coughs> So life on, and the, uh, of matter and antimatter. Uh, as and Bob, uh, twins, so they're born, born pair. Uh, matter and antimatter always are created in pair. Uh, matter and uh, as and Bob are born the same day, and matter and antimatter created at the same time. Uh, brother and sister were fight each other all the time. Uh, 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 <laughs> matter antimatter annihilate each other. Now there may be a bit of bullying going on here, uh, but in case of matter and antimatter, <clears throat> they, they, when they meet, they annihilate uh, uh, into energy. So how do we create antimatter? So this famous equation. E equal uh, mc squared from Einstein tells you that uh, uh, under some circumstances you can convert the energy into mass. Uh, so if you're clever, you can convert pure energy into mass. So energy, you give energy to something, and matter and, and antimatter are pair created. So that's how you create antimatter. If, if matter and antimatter meets, uh, so, so most, in almost all cases, physics uh, uh, is the same if you reverse, reverse time. Time is reverse, reversal. So, you, so if, you, uh, if it's OK on the left side, it's okay, it must be OK on the right side. If, if matter and antimatter meet, they turn it to, uh, to energy. And that's how uh, antimatter uh, and, 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 and matter annihilate. So uh, that was a basic analogous analogy expression of what the antimatter is. But why? Uh, the question now I want to address is why do we bother studying antimatter? So there are three categories of reasons that I can think of. One is easy, easy one. So I go back to the universe. <clears throat> so in the beginning of the universe, which you believe about, was about, about uh, 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 14 billion year ago, years ago, uh, we think there's an equal amount of a matter and an antimatter created. Because they have to be created in pairs. When you create something, uh, when you create an antimatter, antimatter has to be created at the same time. <clears throat> so you can ask the question, what happens to antimatter? Is there, is there, maybe there's an antimatter uh, existent in, in the universe somewhere. 
So, so we can look for a sign of the, the existence of an antimatter in the universe uh, by looking for a sign of annihilation. <clears throat> so as I, as I mentioned earlier, when, when if there's an antimatter in some parts of the universe, uh, uh, if it meets matter, uh, it annihilates. It gives out some uh, energy. Uh, and we can, we can, by a good telescope, we can look for the sign that things may be annihilating. <clears throat> so for example, we can start uh, nearby. Here, we know atoms involved by matter, but not antimatter, because they, don't, they didn't annihilate each other. A human, human landed in the moon, and, and so an astronaut didn't annihilate. So we know the moon is made of uh, matter, not antimatter. Uh, we landed in the, moon, the Mars, so we know Mars made of matter, not antimatter. And you can actually <clears throat> continue this inference as deeply as you can observe in the universe. <clears throat> and you see very little evidence that, that any annihilation is occurring. Uh, so even Hollywood uh, noticed this, uh, that, that uh, the extra, extra, extraterrestrial uh, is made of a matter, uh, not antimatter. Except maybe there's a little bit of annihilation in, 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 at, at the tip of the finger there. <clears throat> uh, so as far as we can observe, there's just no antimatter uh, in the universe. <clears throat> and uh, so the, the easy reason for us to study, number, the reason number one, we want to study antimatter to understand what happened to antimatter in the universe. Now, if you think a little bit further uh, about what happens to antimatter and matter. So, as I said, in the beginning, we think there was equal amount of matter and antimatter created. And uh, in the evolution of the universe, they must meet each other uh, eventually. Uh, and we, we see no evidence of uh, existing uh, remaining antimatter. So eventually, they'll meet, other, <coughs> meet each other, and there'll be nothing left, uh, and uh, only lots of energy in the form of light. But that's not what we see. We see us. We see the Earth. We see the Sun. So the variation of this, this uh, re reason is uh, why is there something rather than nothing? So this uh, is uh, one of the main reasons why we're going to study antimatter, <clears throat> by looking at the, uh, to see if there's any fundamental differences uh, between hydrogen and antihydrogen by studying them precisely uh, in the laboratory. Is that, is that reasonably clear? No? Okay, we can talk about it later. <laughs> <coughs> so the, the here, the, 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 uh, my curly bracket occurs. <coughs> now for me, this is a convenient expression. Uh, uh, and uh, there's a question one can ask, uh, whether it's kind of academically ingenious to give a convenient explanation to the public. And when you speak to the reporter, when you have about two, 10 seconds uh, or half a minute, this is the version that I give. Uh, <coughs> the reason number two <coughs> is a little bit more subtle, <coughs> but, uh, but uh, crucial. And this has to do with the found, really foundation of the, of the physics. <coughs> so the uh, two uh, uh, pillars of modern physics is the relativity and the quantum mechanics. <coughs> and uh, uh, so these, these uh, uh, laws, these, these uh, uh, framework is not just another law. It's really the, uh, uh, like constitution. It's, it's a law that governs other laws of physics. So of course, if you see uh, our constitution, you see the relativity and quantum mechanics written somewhere there. It should be anyway. <laughs> uh, so this uh, combination of uh, 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 the, the two foundations now theory uh, of physics predicts this existence of antimatter. Uh, and matter. So if, if you see any difference in the fundamental property of this uh, uh, between matter and antimatter, that tells you that uh, uh, the basic foundation has to be rewritten. The, the, so, so I sometimes, uh, you know, finding a new particles, for example, in, in physics is a great thing. You know, you probably win Nobel Prize just by finding a new particle. But for me, finding a new particle uh, is just like uh, rewriting a parking law. Uh, you know, I mean, okay, yeah, nature wanted to have another particle, sure, that we can change. If the parking uh, uh, fee, you know, is free after 6 p.m., that's convenient, too. 
<coughs> whereas uh, this one, uh, it's really a, a, a change in a, a constitution. <coughs> so, <coughs> so the reason number two <coughs> is what's really the, the, the uh, theory that governs the, the, the theory of the universe, uh, theory of everything. <coughs> so in my humble opinion, this is more, more important. Uh, <coughs> But it's a little bit uh, uh, more difficult to explain. Now, of course, the real reason I study antimatter is not all that, all the stuff that I talked about. Because that's really so cool. And it's actually, a, a, it's pun intended, as uh, become apparent later. <laughs> <clears throat> so I talked about the what is antimatter, why we study antimatter. So now I go into how uh, we study how we, we study antimatter. <clears throat> so uh, how do we get antimatter atoms? Now for normal matter, matter you can buy and you can buy everything on, on, on the web these days. So if you go to web, you can buy a bottle of hydrogen for about fifty bucks, about ten gram, uh, ten liter. It's about weight wise, uh, about one gram of hydrogen. <clears throat> but anti hydrogen, uh, you have to you can't just buy of the web, you have to synthesize from its ingredients. <coughs> now, in, in order to explain why this is a hard thing to do, I have to little bit, give you a little bit of background. Uh, <coughs> that is, uh, uh, temperature is roughly equivalent to energy. So when uh, today is kind of cold, in the cold days, uh, air molecules moving slowly. Uh, when the hot days, air molecules are uh, moving f fast. So te temperature is a measure of uh, how fast the, uh, uh, your particle is moving. <coughs> so having said that, <coughs> why is making anti-atom is hard? And making anti-atom is hard because you have to first give a lot of energy uh, to create a matter and antimatter pair in the first place. So first you need a lot of energy. So when you make antimatter particles, they come out uh, as really uh, near the speed of light. That's the only way to make it. <clears throat> uh, but in order to combine them and, and make atoms, you have to slow them down, uh, which a process we call cooling. The cooling is a technical term. Here too, you have to cool <coughs> whatever uh, thing that you want to you study. <coughs> and uh, I come back to this cooling uh, 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 a few times because this is uh, almost the name of the game in this uh, uh, field. So how do we synthesize ant <coughs> anti-hydrogen atom? <coughs> so we first uh, prepare antimatter uh, protons, uh, uh, about 20,000 of them. Of them. And, and we combine them with about two million uh, po positrons. No, no, you can't do that. You, you can't just say that. How do you create that? Well, I'll get to that. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I in, it's you fine to interrupt. Tricks, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> and protons we we uh, obtain from the uh, facility at CERN, which I'll also show you the animation of how, how we do it. But these antiprotons created a really a high energy, so, uh, uh, and you had to cool it to about uh, 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 minus 200 degrees Celsius. So you had to cool it down by order of factor trillion, you know, to be useful. <clears throat> uh, positrons, it's a little bit easier. You can buy them, not all off the web, uh, but you can buy them from a company. Uh, so you can e even have it in your bedroom if you, if you really want to. And in this case, you only uh, have to cool down by a factor of a, a billion, a trivial, co in comparison. <coughs> Where do we do this? Uh, we do this uh, study uh, uh, in Geneva at the CERN laboratory because uh, it's the only place in the world right now where you can get the uh, uh, antipoton beams. <coughs> so here uh, uh, is the uh, uh, CERN, uh, the, this red thing is a ring of a large hadron collider. Uh, which is a 27 kilometers uh, in circumference. Uh, it's a big machine. Uh, we only, uh, but AD and proton distillator is a tiny dot. So I don't work in this big thing, but I just work in this tiny thing. It's just, just to give a scale, 
Uh, airport, shown here, uh, this line here is an airport, Geneva Airport, Lake of Geneva and then Alps in the back. <clears throat> so we uh, make antipotons by first uh, getting a lot of uh, energy by uh, accelerating normal uh, protons. So here's how it works. So we accelerate the normal, proton normal matter particle to high energy. <clears throat> and then you collide it with some stuff uh, to give a lot of energy. So that when, when the reaction have a lot of energy, anything can come out. And you choose, you pick antipotons, is, because that's what you will study. Uh, and then you, you inject into this ring in, uh, uh, to decelerate. So this is, decelerating facility is called antiproton decelerator. Where, 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 where were antimatter? Yeah. Well, so they come out of vacuum. <laughs> so the vacuum, we think, is, is, is not empty. It's full of stuff. And if, you, if you're clever, you can take things out. <laughs> uh, so, no, no, no it's, 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 I think what I said is technically correct. Uh, but, but, but you have to, there's no free lunch, though. You have to give energy to, to get things out. So you can't, you can't just generate power out of vacuum. Antiprotons created in the collision. Okay. Uh, 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 yeah. And we take out antiprotons uh, and, and, and then they the <coughs> Yeah, yeah. And then combine with the antiprotons, uh, sorry, anti, uh, anti electrons. And the whole world is full of protons. Yeah. When you create the antiprotons, yeah. yeah, but that's a great question. I'll get to that. <coughs> <laughs> <coughs> this is great. Huh? <laughs> I like it. I love it. Uh, <coughs> So before just uh, talking about that, uh, I should talk about uh, one form of, of a cooling uh, of antimatter, <coughs> uh, which we succeeded about uh, some, year, some years ago. So an example of cooling is, uh, is called uh, evaporative cooling. So this is how your cup of coffee cools. In coffee, uh, hot molecules. So the molecules, which are moving fast, can uh, get out of the liquid preferentially. The so moving slow ones just get, get stuck there in, in the liquid. So when the uh, molecule that's moving fast leaves the liquid, uh, the average uh, energy of the remaining mo uh, molecules in the liquid is lower. So that's how things cool. The one th one th when things cool, just so you, you, you get, get rid of the uh, high energy guys and, and the leftover with the low energy guys, and, and that's your temp low, you have a lower temperature. I'm not making any social uh, uh, references here. I'm, just <laughs> I'm, th I'm, th I'm making a physics uh, point. <clears throat> so how do you hold, hold antimatter? How do you? So as you said correctly, uh, you need to get rid of matter. Because otherwise they annihilate, they go away. How do we do that? Well, we need a good vacuum pump. In the 50s, this was a revolutionary device, apparently, uh, to, to, to do the vacuum. But the principle of vacuum pump is the same. You suck out all the energy uh, from, from, your, from your equipment. Now, in addition to uh, vacuum pump, uh, we use uh, cryogenic uh, uh, pumping. So, we cool everything uh, uh, to the really, really low temperature. And then what happens is that any remaining gas will just freeze into the, the surface. So that's how you, you create really, really good vacuum. So good vacuum here means that there's no, nothing, uh, no residual uh, molecules in the system. But that's not enough. <coughs> uh, you have to, uh, even if you have nothing in your, in your uh, uh, canister, if uh, antimatter hits the wall, it annihilates. They had to come up with a, a method to, to uh, confine without having wall, walls. And for this, we use a combination of electric and magnetic forces. Oh, by the way, uh, if you Google the vacuum cleaning today, uh, it's dominated by the female images. So we still have uh, uh, some way to go. <coughs> uh, curly bracket. Uh, so the, uh, we uh, use the property of atom or anti-atom uh, which is uh, uh, a tiny, like a tiny ma bar magnet. So, the, uh, so it's this animation here. <coughs> so atoms like a, a tiny bar magnet. And, so the, and this uh, 
uh, background in here is uh, we produce a magnetic field uh, like this, in a, in a, such that uh, when the bar magnet try to hit the wall, it pushes you back from the wall. So this is how uh, confinement <coughs> of uh, uh, anti-atoms or atoms uh, uh, work in a magnetic uh, trap. The problem is that this magnetic force in general is very weak uh, on, on atoms. So that you can only uh, confine the slowest atoms. So it would typically create from one operation about order 10,000 anti-hydrogen atoms. But you get like one. Uh, we set out with like a 0 0.01 or something like that. But now we're getting better at it. But we still only get a few at a time. <clears throat> so that's one of the challenges. Now, how do we observe antimatter? <clears throat> so this is re relatively uh, straightforward compared to other stuff that we had to do. To see antimatter, we have to destroy it. And here is an example <coughs> where how it's done. So it's a, a computer display of a real uh, event uh, when antimatter hit the walls, and the walls are not shown here. And then from the annihilation, these high energy particles come out, which is in turn detected by uh, these uh, particle detectors. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> so again, uh, energy in this, uh, the matter and antimatter pairs go into energy, and this energy is turned into these uh, uh, particles uh, that you can detect. Uh, this made the uh, uh, cover of a uh, physics textbook, actually, uh, so you can buy this uh, for 100 bucks on Amazon. So this is a picture uh, of uh, some few years ago of, of uh, apparatus uh, at CERN. So here is a leader of uh, our uh, uh, Alpha team uh, internationally, and my former student from UBC just telling him what to do here. <coughs> uh, so a little bit of a history of how we got here. <coughs> In about 15 or, uh, well, now 17 years ago, uh, we were able to produce a slow-moving anti-hydrogen at CERN. <clears throat> uh, they were not, but they were not confined. And so after this, we uh, developed a new project to, in order to confine and study anti-hydrogen. And uh, uh, I don't know if you, uh, well, you probably don't, don't know, but the, the, these physics projects have names. And I don't know who started it. Previously, it was just numbers you know, experimental numbers, but nowadays everybody has a name. So when we're studying this experiment, uh, I uh, spent a long time, uh, more than I care to admit, the, the name of, the, of the, this experiment. So my suggestion, initial suggestion, was AIL, anti-hydrogen laser experiment. I even have a, had a logo. Uh, <laughs> by the way, you can't get this in BC liquor store anymore. You have to, but, but if you make a special order, you can get it. Just uh, <laughs> Uh, but this name was uh, rejected uh, <laughs> by my colleagues. So my second suggestion was anti-hydrogen laser physics apparatus. That's how Alpha, uh, what, what, what Alpha stands for. <clears throat> Alpha is an international collaboration of uh, uh, 16 or so institutions from eight countries, 40, 50 people. And we have a significant Canadian uh, involvement uh, from uh, uh, nine faculty now, uh, including Tim who just uh, Became a, uh, was hired in Calgary, and many students and, and postdocs. Uh, and we consist, consist about uh, 30 to 40 percent of the entire collaboration. It's a great team effort. I was going to show some stuff uh, in case trans people were there, but I, well, I see a couple. So, so a lot of trans people helped out in the construction. <coughs> and, and when we built uh, equipment at CERN, we all go there and try to uh, uh, make this work. I just want to highlight this, uh, uh, one of my former students. <coughs> so here he was transporting this half million dollar magnet uh, in a steep stairs. Uh, so he successfully uh, succeeded in, in this operation for, for which he won a uh, thesis prize. <laughs> Actually, he did, <laughs> Actually, he did a little, little more than that. <laughs> no, he was a great student, actually. <coughs> So <coughs> it's a little bit of a more of an animation of uh, how uh, things work. <coughs> uh, animation made by a UK, you, you have, you, if you pay southern bucks or so, they, they make you this kind of stuff now, <coughs> like this. <coughs> so this is the uh, outside of our experiment. There's three layers of panels, uh, the particle tracking detector, which detects 
uh, anti-halogen annihilation. <coughs> if you peel this off, you see the magnets. So it's this magnet that makes, uh, that push the, uh, the atoms away from the walls. <coughs> and we, uh, uh, and, and actually hold this thing is a superconducting, meaning that it only works uh, at the uh, minus uh, 270 or so uh, degrees centigrade. So you have to keep everything cold to have the strongest magnet possible. <coughs> and we, we put order of uh, 1,000 amp uh, in this uh, magnet, which is uh, a lot of current. <coughs> uh, if you peel this off, inside this is, is a, a vacuum chamber. The vacuum uh, is a very, very good vacuum, as I said, because of a, a good pump and a cryogenic uh, pumping. And these are the electrodes, yellow ones are uh, electrodes. So these are the ones that are uh, uh, things that are, that are first uh, uh, hold antipotons and positrons from which uh, we form uh, antihydrogen. <coughs> Uh, so we gently uh, mix antipotons and positrons inside this uh, electrode. And this generally mixing part has taken us several years and we're still trying to improve <coughs> how to do this. <coughs> uh, they, and if you're successful, uh, then you can actually uh, form from the collision of uh, antipoton and a positron. You can form an atom uh, of uh, antihydrogen in this, uh, shown in this animation. <coughs> Now, we, as I said, we can only tell that antihydrogen was created by, by destroying it. So, so as soon as we uh, uh, create and uh, trap antihydrogen, uh, we, uh, also, so antihydrogen trap would look like this, uh, like, a, like a bathtub almost. <clears throat> and, uh, and as soon as we trap antihydrogen, we shut down, this, uh, uh, magnetic, shut down the magnetic field, release antihydrogen, and then let it hit the walls. <clears throat> And then when we hit the walls, it annihilates. So it's, it's this annihilation is a signature that we actually have created and trapped and released antihydrogen <coughs> in our apparatus. So in 1999, in, in, in 2000, uh, 2009, we, ha we had our first uh, signals of uh, trapping antihydrogen. But we're only uh, certain about 99.9%. Uh, we had a lot of discussion what to do with this uh, data. <coughs> But in the end, we did not claim that we have trapped antihydrogen. Uh, so this is a, a physics is very conservative in this kind of thing. Uh, it took another two years of hard work to really understand uh, our uh, uh, system before uh, we can claim <coughs> the, uh, uh, w before we went public announcing the antihydrogen was being trapped. About 38 atoms uh, trapped for a fraction of seconds. <coughs> so this was actually a big news uh, several years ago. Uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> so that, that made us happy. <clears throat> now, I just want to make a kind of a curly bracket uh, uh, remarks. I don't know if there are uh, social scientists and, and uh, black scientists here. Well, what's up with you guys? Like this <laughs> replication crisis. Uh, like there's, a, there's a big thing going on now, uh, especially in psychology and other thing that uh, the things are just not reproducible. And, and uh, I guess you guys are using p-value of 0 0.05, which is uh, like a total, we, we don't even like a write paper. So, so anyway, that's just for the dinner conversation. <laughs> now I don't believe anything I read on, on, on the internet when it comes to medical thing or something like that. <laughs> uh, if you make some uh, discovery, people write uh, about, uh, you write uh, the cartoon about you. <laughs> so this was uh, a cartoon, uh, one of them. Um, uh, my wife was, was more understanding than this, but, uh, <laughs> but I draw uh, attention to this 38 atoms. So this was uh, just accidentally the same as, uh, or maybe not, maybe not coincidence, this uh, the, it, the antipoton uh, chalkboard uh, also saw that 38 the negative particles. And that means you saw 38 exposures. Yeah, 38, uh, that's right, yeah, uh, correct, yeah, yeah. So, so there's efficiency, with, yeah, so in real number of atoms, it's about uh, twice as much as that. Good point. Now, <coughs> the initial uh, uh, result uh, was that we wanted to not lose any confined atoms, so we, we trapped it and we released it as, as quickly as we can. So that was about the fraction of 0.2 seconds. <coughs> and subsequently, we've been able to uh, uh, confine antihydrogen atom for as long as 1,000 seconds. <coughs> so this made, uh, uh, I got to write this paper, and this made the cover of uh, Nature Physics. Now, uh, if you're a football player, uh, you might be on a, well, you might want to be on a, on a cover of Vogue magazine, 
but of course, uh, here, if you're a physicist, you want to be a couple in the nature. Now, <laughs> now uh, <clears throat> it's also gratifying that uh, one of our students, same, same student there, uh, Andrea, was featured in the top page, uh, homepage of CERN. This is the only UBC students uh, that I know of that have been featured in the CERN uh, 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 webpage up to now, so it's great for her. <clears throat> I just want to give you some flavor of what happened after this. So, you know, when, when, they, when, when they write the stories, for example, CPC, people can comment. And, and be careful about what you write, because I read every single one of them. <laughs> I'm going to introduce some of the things that people wrote. <coughs> so this is what you want to hear, right? <laughs> uh, but you get this too. Now, I don't know what this, is, this person is talking about. All my students were in their 20s. I was already 40 at this time, right? So, so there was nobody in their 30s. <laughs> Fair enough. Maybe not anti-lecture, but anti-poverty. Anti, anti <laughs> and, and, and sometimes you get this, and uh, we spend a lot of money. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fair point. <clears throat> but uh, I'm going to draw things to the next one. So don't, don't bring up a great... <laughs> Uh, this part I, I get uh, often, but an uh, interesting point this person made, one more thing, tidy up your cables. I have to fix it. Now, as a, as a supervisor, I tell all of my students, don't leave the cables on the ground. Uh, because the cables, uh, broken cables are really hard to fix, because you don't know that it's, it's broken, or it could be intermittently broken. So this is the worst thing you could do uh, to your experiment. But now I call in the national media that my cable is on the floor. <laughs> so this was an embarrassing moment. <clears throat> now, so we trapped anti-hydrogen in, in a bottle, this magnetic the device called magnetic bottle. I called for le this lecture, uh, anti-universe in the bottle. So, you know, it's a bit of an exaggeration, admittedly. But actually, uh, oh, by the way, this is a, 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 one of my postdoc, uh, uh, Chuckman, is, is great in his 3D thing, so he, he makes all this stuff. Now, 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 it's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's actually not a terribly bad approximation <coughs> for the following reason that I noticed. <coughs> Let's say 75% of the uh, universe is made of, no stuff in the universe is, is uh, hydrogen. So if you have an uh, anti-hydrogen, it's like 75% of an uh, anti-universe to begin with. And also, it just turns out that the density of anti-hydrogen we have in, in this bottle, <coughs> so it's actually, so it's, yeah, I should say that uh, the magnetic bottle is about 25 centimeter in length and about 4.5 centimeter in diameter. So it's uh, similar to inside of this, this uh, uh, water bottle. And nowadays we, we can accumulate up to several hundred uh, uh, atoms here. So the density uh, is about one anti-atom per cubic centimeter. And this density just turns out to be similar to the density of an interstellar medium, uh, so in the universe. Uh, which is also almost also made of hydrogen. So, so I decided to use this title for my uh, real physics lectures uh, 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 in addition to uh, public lectures. Anyway, <clears throat> so we trapped anti-hydrogen, uh, uh, we celebrated, and it's slightly illegal to uh, drink alcohol uh, in, in experimental zone uh, at CERN. It's completely illegal to do in Canada, so don't do it here. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, so we're celebrating with, with champagne. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, but uh, uh, so we succeeded. So now what? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> we want to study the property, and one of the ways to study property of anti-hydrogen is to uh, measure the color. <clears throat> now, what's the color uh, of uh, uh, of uh, atoms? So according to uh, laws of quantum mechanics, uh, uh, each element can emit uh, light at a specific frequencies. Uh, based on its internal structure. <laughs> so this means that if you measure the uh, opposite, in the opposite is true, that, that if you measure the uh, frequency, the, the wavelength of the color, if you measure the color, then it tells you something about the internal structure uh, of the atoms. And what we want to do specifically is to compare the color of uh, anti-hydrogen atoms, antimatter, with uh, that of uh, matter, hydrogen. And the color of hydrogen is one of the things measured most accurately in all of physics. <clears throat> the latest number is measured to four parts in uh, uh, 1,000 trillion 
uh, 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 four parts in the 10 to 15. So this number, you know, just to make sense out of it, I'll try, I try a little bit different uh, way. One way is, so this ratio is about the size, of, so knowing that when you're measuring the uh, circumference of Earth, which is about 40,000 kilometers, knowing that to a fraction of a micron, which is the size, size of a bacteria. I mean, still, I can't you know, feel the size of Earth or, or bacteria directly, so it still may not make sense, but, but still, this is the best I can come up with it. <clears throat> so, so, so it's really, really well measured so, so in, in normal matter, so, so we want to do that in antimatter to see if there's any difference. What is the color of any matter in any antimatter? That's the theory. Pardon? No, no, no. no that, that's what the uh, Dirac already won Nobel Prize. Yeah. No, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So the theory predicts that they have to be the same. <clears throat> and the theory, not just the parking law theory, the, the, the constitution of physics tells you that they have to be the same. So if you see any difference, then you have to rewrite the constitution. If you see the difference. So you have to, you have to see the difference to win Nobel Prize. Though. Well, in, no, the theory, the theory predicts that they have to be the same. Theory of the laws of physics. And we have not found anything That's right, yeah. Okay. Or, I, or I wouldn't tell you. Uh, <laughs> 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 Yet. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so the first attempt uh, was done uh, with uh, our UBC colleague, an SFU colleague, and, and Walter Hardy, just, he's playing hockey today, so he didn't want to, uh, he couldn't come. <clears throat> uh, but uh, uh, we used the uh, microwaves uh, to, the, uh, to, to study the, the anti-hydrogen atom. Microwaves, like, uh, you know, it's like in a, in a kitchen. So that microwaves uh, can excite atoms, uh, to, uh, and you can study this. And uh, so here is a bit of a YouTube video that uh, some people made. It was a... <coughs> Oops, sorry. These guys have the unfortunate job of trying to get this device ready under great pressure. We're trying to assemble a piece that we call the stick, which has a number of diagnostic stations on it. We're adding a new diagnostic station for Walter. That's and for which they're all cursing. Now, Walter's our great hope for being famous again. He's a officially retired and doesn't actually need the aggravation after a long and distinguished career. I worked on ordinary hydrogen at low temperatures 30 years ago. And unfortunately, somebody remembered that. If you're around. So that somebody is me. Uh, so I, when I came back to, uh, uh, to Vancouver, first thing I did was talk to Walter. So ever since he's been suffering, because of me. <clears throat> so the people at UBC uh, built this uh, so-called stick, the, the microwave device, <clears throat> and make a long story short, uh, we succeeded in this measurement <clears throat> uh, of uh, uh, doing a, a microwave spectroscopy. So this was a big relief. We, we put a lot at stake uh, uh, for me, and, and it was showed that it's possible to do a measurement uh, on one atom at a time. Normally, you use uh, billions of billions of atoms to, to do measurement. But we showed that even with a, well, this one atom in this volume of this bottle, you can do a measurement. Uh, for this and other reasons, uh, we've been fortunate to uh, given this surprise uh, from, from the government, and this is a, a former uh, uh, governor general. And I got to give a, a, a speech, acceptance speech at the Riddle Hall, the residence of the uh, uh, Governor General, uh, and it went a little bit like this. Oh, by the way, this is gonna show, I'm going to show is a, is a cart, an animation that is popular among young people. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest of honor, Dr. Sheldon Cooper. <laughs> Thanks, Shorty. I'll take it from here. <laughs> All right, you people ready to have some fun? You have a basic understanding of differential calculus and at least one year of algebraic topology? Hey, right, here come the jokes. <laughs> right, Neutron walks into a bar and asks, how much for a drink? The bartender says, for you, no charge. <laughs> so, speaking of no charge, one of the questions I've been wondering for many years is uh, 
Does antimatter has electric charge? <coughs> uh, we actually, so, so the ordinary matter uh, is neutral, charge neutral. Uh, but we, don't really, we really don't know what, why it is. It just so happens that a, a magnitude of a charge plus charge of a proton is equal exactly, but opposite in sign with that of electrons. And if you put proton and, and electron together, they are measured to be zero to exceedingly high accuracy. And it, these are two different things, proton and electron. So we actually don't know why things are neutral, why, why, why we're made of a neutral stuff. <clears throat> So the question, uh, naturally, for me, I mean, there's actually technical reason, uh, technical expression, but there, there, still, uh, it's natural to ask, is antimatter neutral? So we, we, as a kind of a aside, we did this measurement, uh, and answer, for you, antihydrogen is also no charge, mm -hmm. at least to, uh, to the precision of one part in billion. Okay, so what do we do with the uh, alpha experiment? <clears throat> When you have a success, you know, what do you do with, with your life? <laughs> of course, you destroy, destroy it immediately and build something new, <laughs> which is not always recommended, but, but uh, uh, that we're a bit of a crazy uh, crew, people uh, uh, in uh, collaboration. We could have just stayed, kept using this device and keep uh, producing uh, writing papers, but we went to something uh, uh, really uh, much, much more revolutionary. So first thing we did uh, in the last few years is to build the a successor of uh, uh, alpha, original alpha, alpha apparatus called alpha 2. And we've been studying the uh, property of anti-hydrogen very precisely. <clears throat> and this already resided in something like uh, four nature particle, uh, articles. Uh, and now we can study the, the anti-hydrogen property to the, about uh, two parts in, in a trillion. So getting close to within a factor of a few hundred to the anti-matter uh, hydrogen numbers that, that I talked about earlier. <coughs> uh, so here is the, again, com comparison we want to make about this transition, the color of atoms. And the rest of the uh, time, so I want to talk a little bit about the latest stuff, uh, laser cooling. Uh, really exciting stuff. But before moving that, I just want to flash through the, uh, uh, more, uh, uh, another d experiment that we were building called Alpha G, uh, which is to study the uh, gravitational force on antimatter. The question really is does antimatter fall down in the same way as matter does? And of course, the theory says it has to be the same. Yeah? But they we're, we're, uh, were experimental physicists, so we want to check uh, if the. On the left? <laughs> yeah, color is just uh, just uh, uh, pictorial, as 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 no no uh, physical meaning. And same as this color. So the question is: Apple falls to Earth in the same uh, uh, way as anti-apple falls. So a few slides about <coughs> how how this is going <coughs> before getting back to the laser cooling. <coughs> so CERN shuts down. Just shut, when when inter extended shutdown, that's just last fall. So we had a tight deadline to make this uh, experiment work. So we've been working towards this in the last uh, couple of years uh, to do a first measurement before CERN shut down. And an example of construction uh, done at Triumph is this uh, 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 big detector, the two and a half meter detector, uh, were built at Triumph with the students and the postdocs uh, contributing. <clears throat> and I like this, uh, uh, particularly this uh, uh, thing because it looks like uh, this. <laughs> now, <clears throat> so at Triumph, we built this uh, detector to detect antimatter uh, uh, positions. And then uh, in uh, last summer, we shipped this uh, in a big trailer, an airplane to CERN. And in September, uh, we installed this. <clears throat> so this is a part of the bigger <coughs> equipment, uh, which is uh, uh, so, showing, so this is an uh, outside magnet. It's about three meters tall. And this one of our postdocs uh, just connecting some cables. <coughs> uh, <coughs> yeah, I guess it's kind of hard to see in this. Uh, so this, uh, another few BBC student, Nathan, who is currently at CERN, is installing this. Uh, uh, so trap, it's a long trap. The alpha one trap was, was this long. 
The alpha two trap is go over two meters because you want to drop this over the long distance. Uh, sorry, alpha G drop, the alpha G trap is, is much longer. So, so it's in, in sewing, and, and you have to wear all these harnesses. You have to actually get a training to work in this height. Uh, another postdoc of a uh, mine here working on this. And then, now, in the end, we were not able to make a deadline. So we couldn't do the first measurement of gravity, unfortunately. So we're both sad and proud, proud that we worked really hard for several months and made a, a very significant progress. Uh, but uh, so we had to wait till 2021 to do this measurement on, on gravity. <clears throat> Here's uh, about 30 people uh, from, from the... Oh. Uh, close down to uh, uh, save money for the at least Large Hadron Collider upgrade. It's a shutdown for, 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 for two and a half years. Uh, it, it costs money to run accelerators. So, so why don't you close the machine down and go home? They're improving it. They're improving it. Are yeah. They, are they changing? Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're upgrading. They, they, oh, they, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So then in the last few minutes, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, laser cooling uh, of antimatter, the, the, the things that I've been working uh, on uh, on last uh, several months. Now, it's a preliminary result. <clears throat> and... Uh, there's a big kind of issue about uh, commercialism in science publication. So journals like Nature or Science, uh, they have an embargo policy. Uh, so, uh, so you can't talk to, uh, I guess, reporters. And so, so I hope there's no reporter here. <clears throat> uh, 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 we are allowed to talk to scientific audience. So from now on, I'm going to assume that I'm going to declare that this is a scientific meeting. Okay, well, I mean, so, so it's not a general public talk. So, so, th so that, that covered my, uh, my butt. <clears throat> now, uh, <clears throat> Evidence of hard work. Uh, so the last triumph was closed during the holidays. So, so I was work coming in every day, and this uh, both Tim Horton and, and, and the Starbucks really helped me over the over the two weeks uh, uh, period. <clears throat> now, laser cooling. <clears throat> what is it? Well, laser cooling is something that revolutionized atomic physics in the past decades, <clears throat> decades really. <clears throat> and uh, a, a photon, which is a particle of light can actually exert a force uh, on atom. So if you throw some ball into somebody, you know, that, that other somebody feels this uh, a hit. And a light is like this. So this actually, uh, my light laser uh, uh, pointer, I want to point to this, it pushes the, the wall a little bit. It's small, so you don't feel it. I mean, I don't feel it. But uh, if you're atom, uh, you feel a little bit of the force. <clears throat> The fact that a, fo a photon can exert the force uh, was first noticed or, or implemented by uh, Ashkin, who just won the Nobel Prize uh, uh, last year. <clears throat> now, laser, of course, are used in uh, many practical applications, like earth surgery. I mean, you can, it's good at heating things up, cutting the metal uh, and curing uh, cancers and stuff. Uh, uh. So this high energy part was, was part of the reason that the uh, Donna Stickman uh, uh, won and shared the Nobel Prize. Uh, by producing high power laser. <clears throat> but again, laser can also uh, be arranged so that you, you slow down atoms. So instead of heating up by using the force of light, <clears throat> you can slow down atoms. Now I'll show you a little bit more about that, but, but if you have a really slow atoms, cold atoms, then what is it good for? Well, it's good for making very, very precise measurements. For example, your uh, GPS in your phone or car <clears throat> Uh, has this uh, uh, precise laser uh, <coughs> uh, in, in type of measurements involved. Uh, or the quantum computers, everything that to do with quantum, you need laser cooling to the lowest temperature possible. <coughs> For us also, uh, so, so this analogy is like, a, you know, let's say you're, you, know, you want to look at somebody's uh, uh, face, right? Uh, uh, it's easier if somebody's walking, slowly walking, and you recognize the, the person. But if that person's really running so fast, uh, or if a car is really running full fast, it's hard to uh, uh, rec recognize. But the similar thing happens in atomic scale. The slower things are easy to measure. <coughs> Furthermore, uh, being cold means, meaning, means, means that it doesn't have a, a extra energy. So that means it's more sensitive to, to other forces. <coughs> so I guess uh, uh, you know, moving teenager uh, by force a teenager with a lot of energy is harder than moving a three-year-old. 
So you want to make a sort of three-year-old version of, of a low, uh, uh, slowly moving uh, antimatter so we can uh, study the effect of gravity, for example. So it's been done in normal atom for, <coughs> for a few decades. But what's the challenge for, for doing for antimatter? Now, in fact, this was one of the dreams for me to do laser cooling. I mean, in fact, dream for the field <coughs> because of its, its potential uh, applications that I mentioned. Uh, but the challenge is the, that a uh, uh, laser, you need a special kind of laser to cool anti-hydrogen <coughs> or hydrogen atom for that matter. <coughs> so normally in atomic physics, uh, you first choose a laser. So this is a semiconductor laser. You can buy it for a few bucks. And then you choose laser, and then you, choose, you go to that periodic table, and you pick the atom that, that matches your laser. Yeah, so laser comes first. <coughs> uh, in antimatter, we don't have that luxury. We only have one element. <coughs> so we have to suit our laser to, to the uh, element of antihydrogen. And uh, this has been really the challenge. And, uh, but uh, uh, we recognized some, year, some time ago that the, since we can confine antihydrogen for a long time, even a weak laser can uh, induce this force. So this is a cartoon from a, a Nobel <coughs> uh, uh, page. So here, the, you, atoms kind of sh coming this way, and then you're using laser to really slow down and stop it. Uh, in reality, a laser cannot be as efficient for antimatter. So it's more like a rocket where you know, most time it goes through, and sometimes you, 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 know, you slow down. So efficiency is very low, but that's what we have. <coughs> so this is what I proposed uh, together with a, a theory colleague uh, a few years ago, and already proposal got a lot of attention. <coughs> even before doing anything. You know. Now, uh, so the, uh, oh, by the way, uh, National Post, uh, whatever your political opinion about the, 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 the <laughs> newspaper, they're pretty good with science. Just putting in the advertisement for them. <laughs> uh, uh, so who can build a laser? You know, I'm not a la laser expert, I can't build myself. So I've been looking around. You know, there's a Japanese saying that uh, the, the, the bottom of the, your, your uh, lighthouse is, is the darkest. <coughs> so it turned out our uh, own uh, uh, Takamomose, a professor from chemistry department, uh, can build this laser, uh, uh, this really uh, complex, uh, uh, sophisticated laser. <coughs> and together with uh, Taka, who is just traveling back from CERN today, <coughs> uh, we've been uh, working on this for the last several years. And we have some first successes with uh, uh, this new laser. Uh, after uh, intense development. <clears throat> the first of which was published uh, last September, and this is first identifying that transition. Oh, here, so in the last few minutes, a little bit technical, uh, so, so, so I apologize. <laughs> 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 I, I was kind of aiming at some physicists who are in audience, actually, that, 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 that are there now. <clears throat> so the, uh, first, we had to identify the, the, uh, uh, this light, which light that uh, this uh, antihydrogen uh, emits for this particular uh, thing that we want to do. Uh, and, and so that's, that's called Lyman alpha light. light. This is uh, actually the most fundamental atomic light in the universe. Uh, uh, yeah, just, just, just be there. Yeah, be, be patient for a few minutes, please. Uh, 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 <coughs> so the f uh, first, uh, you have to identify, the, observe that you can actually see that line. <coughs> and the second thing we did uh, is to measure using this laser, uh, we actually measure new quantity. So whenever new, you have a new tools, you can really uh, study new things. And what we uh, claim we did, a paper we submitted last December, is we measured what call, what's called the lamb shift. <clears throat> so lamb shift is a, a tiny deviation from a theory of Dirac that predicted antimatter in the first place. And so observed by Will Slam in 1947. And this shift uh, was a real departure in modern physics. And it was explained by uh, uh, Richard Feynman and uh, other great theorists. And so Richard Feynman is like a rock star in the 20th, 20th century physics. Huh. So, so whenever you, know, you, you have, can have anything to do with the Richard Feynman, you want to do it. So, so we did that. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the uh, interpretation was disputed by a uh, referee now. So I'm in a, when a, a big fight with the referee about, uh, about this particular interpretation. Uh, but uh, after working on several weeks, I mean, I, I don't agree with the referee, but I think the uh, referee's uh, point kind of made me come up with a better, a clearer uh, interpretation. So, so uh, although I was pissed off, but, but I'm, I think it still means that a peer review is working. 
<coughs> so going back to this is completely technical. Going back to the laser cooling. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so we drive. So just 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 uh, close your ear for 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 for, for one minute. <laughs> Why don't you explain? <laughs> we're 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 driving these particular transitions, and these are the evidence <coughs> that we actually cooled uh, antimatter uh, uh, to substantially, and uh, <coughs> these are primarily. And the one thing I guess maybe I really uh, should uh, note is that the uh, time it takes to cool antihydrogen right now takes like 10 hours. Whereas normal atoms, you can cool in milliseconds with a laser like this. So it's really, really long process uh, and difficult. But we think we, we nailed this. Uh, so this could change everything. Because from now on, everybody who does antihydrogen study has to start from this. So this is a complete game changer, if, if, if we were right. No. <laughs> so you can use it for free. <laughs> so I'm way over the time, so I'm going to summarize now. So I try to show it to you, and uh, explain to you, antimatter really exists, and we can study them. We can study them precisely. Uh, in the past uh, 20 years, we've been able to produce, confine this spectroscopy, and pre demonstrate perhaps laser cooling, and now we're getting ready for a uh, gravity experiment. <clears throat> so it's really an exciting time uh, to be for antimatter anti studies. <clears throat> so I just want to close with just by acknowledging the hardworking students, Richard, who won the uh, thesis prize for carrying the magnet. He also uh, is. He also published a book. His, his thesis was chosen as a book, so so that was that was great. <clears throat> uh, so finally, thank you, uh, Richard Erickson, Green College, uh, for having me to have lived here for the best years of my uh, time at UBC. Uh, and also have uh, me uh, give me opportunity to talk to you about the latest development in antimatter studies. So with that, I finish. Thank you. <laughs>